Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you for coming to our session this afternoon. We're so excited to be here and to share our issues with you around health disparities. As we talk about Penn impacting health disparities, you know, we have a lot of things that we're doing here on campus that really highlights some of the issues and some of the research and programs that we do to really eliminate health disparities around Philadelphia and around the globe. But today we're going to talk about it from a three different perspectives from our colleagues here to see what they've been doing around the issue of health disparities. Um, our bios are written in the magazine, the, the PET program that you have, so I'm not going to introduce everybody by their biographical sketch. Please take time to read them. But I'm a professor in the School of Nursing. I'm the director of a Center of Health Equity Research. We used to call it health disparities research. And last year we went through a real big change to change our title to health equity research. And so as we think about health disparities, we want to flip you to think about health equity too, because it makes us think of do a certain types of lens. So um, as we think about it, health disparities, you guys, you know, the health disparities refer to differences in the incidence, prevalence, and burden of disease, including access to health, quality of health care, health outcomes, and the mortality rate that exists around the United States and around the world. We also know that it, you know, it can be based on populations groups based on age, gender, ethnicity, SES, geography, sexual orientation, and disability. You know, these are some of the illnesses that we always focus on when we talk about health disparities research. Is it, is it HIV and AIDS? Is it cardiovascular disease? Is it obesity? Is it cancer? Is it diabetes? Is it any of these things that we always talk about when we think about health disparities amongst a particular population? And we also know that these are some of the factors that get in the way that promote this health disparities in a given population attitudes and beliefs, this culture, religion, <laughs> communication, you know, denial, poverty, all of these things affect, you know, health disparities. But if you think about it, what is health equity? Health equity gives us, is that it concerns those differences in the population that can be traced to unequal economic and social conditions and, we, and, and are systematically unavoidable and thus inherently unjust and unfair. It makes us focus on social injustice. And that's what we're thinking about now at the School of Nursing. Pen tend to, people tend to you know, treat their health disparities to behavior, genes, nature, or inevitability. However, tackling health equity requires us to widen our lens, to bring into view the ways in which jobs, working conditions, education, housing, social inclusion, and you know, political influences of a community. So health equity forces us to look at social justice and injustice. So as we go through this, looking at a different lens, I want to introduce my pa panel to you today. We have a wonderful group of people that's here to talk about some of these issues. We've got Dr. Ann DePice. Dapis. Dapis. I see, I, I told you I was going to do it wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Culturally correct, you must always say the name's DePice. <laughs> we have uh, Colette Lamarck Gillette. And we have Dr. John Wynn. Woo, go. I did it. <laughs> you know, when you think Two about. Three, that's all right. <laughs> Think about one of the important things is in culture and cultural uh, competence is that we respect people's names and that we get their names right when we say it and we acknowledge it and apologize if we say it wrong. And so it's important as a people that we always give rights and, and, and props to our people and to each other. And so I'm so honored to have you ladies and gentlemen here today. What we're going to do is give each panelist about five minutes to talk about their issues and what they want to share, and then we're going to open up to dialogue, and we welcome all of your questions and all of your energy in this room today, and I'm hoping that at the end we can think about new ways of making a difference around Philadelphia, around the state of Pennsylvania, and around the globe in reducing health disparities and health equity. I will begin with Dr. Yeah, Epis. Right. Thank you. When is she in Lenape? Um, she's First, I want to show you a picture. Some of you may have received this picture last night at one of the panels. And it is actually one of the most important things that I have to say today. Because the people on here are black, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, and all other. <laughs> and this is what Native Americans, or as we say in Indian country, Indians, deal with all the time. We are other. We don't exist. So unfortunately, I have to give you numbers today that you probably have never heard of. Because under other, you won't have them broken out and understand what they mean. In 2005, the Penn Schools of Nursing and Medicine held the first ever Ivy League conference on 
Indian Health, entitled, a long title, must be academic. Summit on American Indian Health Care, Bridging the Canyon, Strategies to Reduce Health Inequities for American Indians. I was part of the planning committee for the conference and we focused on issues that most affect American Indians. Obesity, type 2 diabetes related, and violence. And along with each of these are all kinds of related illnesses, diseases, problems, things to prevent. In 2004, I had written that accidents, homicide, and suicide kill children and youth in far larger numbers than any other racial group. Later in life, heart disease, chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, and diabetes kill Indian adults greatly out of proportion to any other groups. Lung cancer is increasing among Indians, but even though Indians still smoke more than any other group, they don't usually live long enough to die of lung cancer. An irony there. Smoking, of course, also contributes to these other problems, related diseases. American Indians also have the highest incidence of alcoholism of any racial group. We have the highest rates of unemployment, poverty, and school dropout. And I know most of you have not heard those numbers. As serious as these numbers are, and directly related to the depression, PTSD, and stress-related diseases that Indians suffer, the 2004 Bureau of Justice Statistics reports that American Indians experienced violence at a rate about two and a half times the national rate of 41 per thousand for all races. 101 per thousand for Indians, 50 per thousand for blacks, 41 per thousand for whites, and 22 per thousand for Asians. The report states these findings reveal a disturbing picture of the victimization of American Indians and Alaska Natives. The disparity occurs across age, gender, income level, and housing. Importantly, and this may be one of the most important things I say today, unlike violence that is intra-racial, violence against Indians is done mainly by other others from the other groups, other races. So we have uh, a high predominance of violence, but it is usually one race on another. And I'll give you some more uh, numbers later. But again, the experience of statistics on death and disease among Indians is similar to reading that of undeveloped countries in the news. But it's not seen as statistically significant in the large numbers. So we are other, and this is also, uh, it, this is not just research statistics, but in the media, we hear some very confusing numbers and categories. When race comes up, we hear about whites, blacks, and Hispanics. Did you know Hispanics or Latinos are a race? It gets very confused between ethnic language groups, also part of conquest. Um, and what these categories really are. So I want to spend a little bit more than talking about Indian Health Service when we come back. Uh, it's important for you to know that Indians get free health care. Have you heard that? Um, I'll give you some more information about Indian Health Service. One of the things that I was asked several years ago in a conference was, if Indian Health Service is so bad, would you recommend that clients go to Indian Health Service if they didn't have any other choice? And I had to stop and think about that, which is scary to me. And I finally said, well, legally, community hospitals are not allowed to turn people away, so I would take them to the emergency room. But then the other experience is that often Indians are turned away from community hospital emergency room because they have free health care. So we'll come back. And by the way, the most important thing I say now is Indians in this country are a very good miner's canary. You know, the miners went down, the canary died. What we were talking about in our own research in Oklahoma 12 years ago, obesity, 
type 2 diabetes, obese children, problems with type 2 diabetes in younger children or younger people, guess what? It's now global. Uh, so everything that we say about American Indians has to be understood in terms of what will and does happen to the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Colette Lamar Colette. Is that on? And I'm here from the Office of Minority and Multicultural Health within the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services, where I currently serve as the acting executive director for the past 11 months. Um, I, went, I came to the Office of Minority and <coughs> Multicultural Health, which I'm going to call OMMH from now on, um, from the Center for Health Statistics, where I was dealing with a lot of the um, data issues that you're describing. Um, what we do in the office, one of our major initiatives is the Reducing Health Disparities Initiative, and we wrote one of, well, the only regional plan um, to address health disparities, to address the elimination of health disparities in 13 medical priority areas, um, as designated by the New Jersey legislature, and that included heart disease and stroke and diabetes and kidney and obesity and all the usual suspects. Um, we also did a look at the infrastructure within the department, and um, we had as our goals to improve community outreach from the department, to improve cultural and linguistic competency, to improve race and ethnicity data collection, um, and then to improve the number of minorities in health professions. Um, another um, huge um, activity that we do within the office is the oversight of the Chronic Kidney Disease Task Force, which was also mandated by legislation, where we are charged to look at the prevalence and incidence of kidney disease um, and come up with cost-effective methods for um, reducing the disparity um, in deaths, in outcomes, in morbidity from kidney disease. Um, another initiative that we are charged to, to officiate over is the Healthy People Agenda. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with that, but that's the, the national public health agenda. And so it's our charge to, uh, one, develop the objectives um, related to all of the chronic disease areas, infectious disease, and infrastructure um, in the state that will address um, eliminating health disparities, which is one of the four major um, goals of the public health agenda. Um, in terms of race ethnicity data, we last year, no, nope, actually in 2007, released the first departmental policy on collecting and reporting race ethnicity data, because until then, there, it didn't exist. Um, each department division program is sort of doing it in their own way. Um, and so one of the things that came out of these series of symposiums that the office held throughout the department to educate the staff, the senior staff predominantly, and the, the, um, the membership of the health department on health disparities because we have to raise awareness of the health disparities. People are not generally understanding that they exist, and sometimes we're still convincing people that disparities do exist. And so the outcome of that was, well, if we can't identify the populations that we're trying to help, then how can we do that? So we went through a whole process of serving each of the programs and figuring out what they're doing. And what we learned is that everyone's doing something a little different. And so we developed this policy and we published it in 2007, but we're still following up <laughs> on uh, trying to enforce it and trying to figure out ways to get around some of the barriers that um, exist related to technology and just um, basic knowledge about health disparities. Um, I think I'll stop there and uh, wait for later for the questions. So um, everyone can hear me all right? Okay, so my name is John Nguyen. Uh, in Vietnamese, it would be Nguyen Trường Giang, uh, but uh, John Nguyen is fine. So, tôi làm ở University of Pennsylvania, mà bây giờ tôi muốn nói về một số vấn đề về y khoa mà nhiều người không biết lắm. Tại vì uh, liver cancer thì cũng là một vấn đề cần thiết lắm. Nhưng mà nói thật sự, nhiều người không hiểu biết về... Now, it, you can understand the challenges if you under, only understood three or four words that I just said, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is what we deal with in the Asian American communities all the time with uh, the majority of our populations who are immigrants uh, because we have a much higher immigration rate. We often see this with Latino communities as well. And, uh, and I, I see one of the major problems uh, that we have to deal with in terms of health equity and health 
uh, research here in America with Asian American populations is the issue of language access. We have federal mandates to provide equal access for linguistic services uh, for patients who do not have this, uh, who do not speak English. The problem is these mandates are not funded by anything. Okay, so by law, if you as an institution receive federal funding, uh, f funding for example, you accept Medicare, okay? That means you get federal money. By law, you are supposed to, re uh, to offer these services. Problem is, you don't get reimbursed for it. So if you pay however many dollars per minute for language line, or if you pay to actually hire multilingual staff to interpret for you, those services that you provide are not reimbursed. You can't charge extra for doing that. But it's gonna take you longer. It's gonna be a little bit more challenging for you to do. And a lot of times, what that means is an unfunded mandate means um, uncared for patients, okay? Now, at certain places, for example, Children's Hospital Pennsylvania has done a really great job of bringing in the idea that we're going to actually you know, put our money where our mouth is and, and, and make sure patients know that these services are available and make, make these uh, phones available in every exam room and things like this. But that is really an anomaly in the healthcare system. And uh, I know that at Penn, we don't do it as well, you know, at Huff and Presby where I work. So this is a great challenge and, and something that I try to deal with a lot in, in the work that I do. I am a faculty member here at the University of Pennsylvania in the School of Medicine. I teach medical students, I teach residents, um, I see patients in the hospital and in the outpatient clinic. But I try to make sure that I also go outside the ivory tower of Penn because much of the healthcare that needs to be done for underserved communities has to be done outside of this setting. Uh, we have lots of folks who aren't going to find their way even to the community health centers or to the local free clinics or, any, or anything uh, of the sort because they are so busy trying to make a living, care for their uh, families, and uh, don't have health insurance. And, uh, and when they're faced with the challenges of trying to access a system that uh, doesn't communicate well with them, then it's even more reason for them to try to deal with it on their own until they end up uh, you know, if you're diabetic in ketoacidosis and near death door, and then you find yourself in the emergency room. So, um, so I think that we need to do a lot better in terms of not only providing services, but making sure that some, someone gets paid to do it. Because if in a society like we have here in America, if you don't pay for it, it's not gonna get done, all right? Large institutions are not going to uh, make an effort to do that. And um, so, I think that language is a, a real important thing to think about. And um, as far as data goes, I think it's, uh, I'm glad that, uh, that both Colette and Anne brought up the issue of the importance of good data collecting. Um, and uh, I'd love to see that slide a little bit. Uh, the, you know, quite often, oh, thank you. So let's see. Um, we're looking at, oh, okay, this is just the number of people. But, you know, if you look at, oh, Okay, relative minority unemployment, Asians are way at the bottom in terms of unemployment, um, way at the top for household income, way at, uh, not quite at the bottom, whites are at the bottom for poverty rate, but you know, they're, they're pretty close there. So, so when you think about this and you look at these national data, you say, well, okay, we don't know anything about the Native Americans, mm -hmm. but the Asians are doing fine, we don't need to worry about them. That's right? We're lumped together. Okay, and then, you know, when Asians are not listed as other, which often we are, then we are the gold standard to live up to in terms of education, in terms of income, okay? Uh, but think about who's answering these surveys, okay? Are they immigrants? Are they people who don't speak English? All right? And then think about the makeup of the Asian American population here in America. Are they largely immigrants? Yeah. Okay. Do a large percentage of them not speak English very well? Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at data that have systematically excluded 
a large chunk of people. It's like saying, well, you know, what is the HIV rate among uh, African Americans? Let's just exclude all the men. Let's just, you know, and then say what it is. Now, it's going to change that because there's a higher rate among men than women. Uh, unfortunately, the rate in women is rising, you know. But, um, but you can see how the data can be skewed, right? And, and I think that's very important when we're looking at national data or even regional data that we keep this in the back of our minds in our interpretation. You know, uh, in Philadelphia, we're very lucky to have something called the Public Health Management Corporation data, which, which records household in, uh, information about health. And I've looked at that data, and, and Asians look pretty good there. But then I repeated the study in seven different Asian languages and looked at it again. And when we look just at high blood pressure, for example, and you look at the original uh, data, high blood pressure rates are about a third of what they are in the uh, general population uh, in Asians. But then when you, you look at the data that I collected, they're the same. They're just as bad. Okay, it's because you've excluded the people who don't speak English and the people who are gonna be at higher risk and now you're just looking at high income, high educated younger people who are gonna be willing to answer your survey. And so I think that's really important for us to think about the quality of the data that, that we have as we move forward. And just uh, to close off this discussion uh, before we go in, into other things, it's, you know, some important things to think about in terms of health disparities for Asian American populations is hepatitis B, very, very endemic in a lot of Asian countries. And when people come here, it's gonna be a big problem. Hepatitis B becomes chronic, turns into liver cancer, okay? And we have very high rates of liver cancer among Asian American communities. We have high rates of cervical cancer because women don't get pap tested. And it's one of the most preventable cancers in, uh, that we know of. And yet, if you don't get a pap test, the precancerous lesions won't be treated and it'll turn into cancer. And so uh, we see cervical cancer rates in Vietnamese American women that are three to five times that of the general population. But these things are not often discussed. We have high liver can uh, lung cancer rates because of high smoking rates among Asian men. So these are things that need to be discussed and looked at. Um, and when we aggregate all of the Asian uh, communities together into one lump thing, and sometimes we lump with Pacific Islanders who are completely different population in many ways, uh, we also get data that are hard to interpret. So think about some of those things. I do want to uh, uh, spend just a moment talking about gay and lesbian issues as well, So work with those communities too, and it's important to think about some of the health disparities there. Again, poor data collection. We don't really know a lot about many of the things um, that, that affect these communities from a population-wide uh, level. We don't collect it systematically in the census in, in most ways. Uh, you can kind of extrapolate looking at same-sex couples in households, but what about your unpartnered uh, community members? So um, think about things like mental health. Suicide is very big in the news right now, especially among young people, and there are some very sad stories that have been discussed and important to think about uh, with our gay and lesbian, transgender, and questioning youth. Substance use, substance abuse, and HIV and sexually transmitted infections, of course, things are those things we think about. But then there are other things, for example, breast cancer rates among um, uh, lesbian women, simply because they may delay or not have children, and that exposes them to higher estrogen rates over a lifetime and increases potentially their rates of, of breast cancer. So these are important things, and, uh, and we are still very much at the beginning of studying many of these issues. So I invite you to take a look at that as you think about health disparities and health equity and how we can bring that about, uh, because there is much work to be done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, well, this is a, a nice opening, a nice segue to our panel discussion. As you heard some of these issues that have been discussed so far, we know that there's much more to say and more questions that you may have of our panel. So um, this is the time we would like to open up for dialogue to have you talk to us and uh, ask questions around some of these issues so that they can you know, talk a little bit more about some of the important issues that you might want to hear. So I'm opening it up to you. Yes.
Yeah, all of us do. Yes. Mm -hmm. My God. <clears throat> <laughs> so are we are. Do you think there's anything to be gained in treating people not as minorities, but as majority or demographically changing in terms of the allocation of dollars, insurance, anything? But I just see in every one of panels and in a lot of <laughs> I would like to respond because uh, some Indian tribal chiefs will say that American Indians are not minorities, so it depends on whether we, we mean something in terms of counting. We were the majority a long time ago right. before there was European incursion. Um, so that was changed radically. Uh, but there are, are tribes will often separate themselves and say, well, we're American Indians, but we're not minorities or whatever. I will also say, you have to show both sides, uh, tribes can't decide who is Indian anymore or not. And that becomes a major issue in uh, any of our numbers. Who is Indian? What does that mean in terms of, of uh, health benefits? But I will also say that it's, it's related in my mind, uh, the whole question of, saying positive or equity or minority. Uh, we heard yesterday in one of our uh, meetings about the use of the N-word. And while politically correct people have learned better most of the time, uh, Indians are still fighting the battle that uh, in Washington, D.C., we have a team that's called the Redskins. And every time we hear Redskins, we know that bounties were paid for our Redskins and our Scouts, first by England and then by the U.S. up to the late uh, 1800s. So words are important. Um, I think, though, we need to flesh out more what we're talking about, what it means when we say something. Good point. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, you know, I, I really don't feel that, at least in medical education, we have seen much change uh, in terms of the description of minorities or, or you know, that level of discussion. I think as we move forward, though, it's important to think more in terms of what communities need as opposed to how we talk, uh, what names we give them. And you know, for example, thinking about the groups that I, I work with, uh, particularly since communication is such a big issue, thinking about linguistic needs as opposed to simply calling someone Cambodian versus Korean. Um, uh, but actually talking about what language do we need to communicate with them in. Um, you know, one of the things that I have looked at is some of the uh, nuances of looking at someone's ethnicity or Asian ethnicity in, in uh, you know, Cambodian versus Chinese, <laughs> ethnic Chinese versus Vietnamese or uh, Taiwanese. Ethnicity versus language needs versus uh, nationality. You know, because you can have someone who was born in Cambodia, but their family is Vietnamese and they speak Vietnamese at home, you know, or their family is ethnically Vietnamese and they actually only speak English because they came here when, you know. So, so you can have three different answers to three different questions and how do we define this and how do we allocate dollars for funds if we don't know what we're dealing with, right? So I think looking at specific needs is an important way of addressing some of this rather than just focusing on labels. And to add to that, I just want to say that as you move forward and think about what our schools are doing, nursing and medicine, what we are doing is now making it a big deal to have these conversations. 
before we weren't having the conversations. So now we have courses and things are being threaded through and students are getting different types of experiences so that we produce the right student that's gonna have the right information to provide the right care, which is culturally competent care, to make sure all people of all colors feel good about receiving the right kind of care we want them to receive. And the other thing about health equity, for me, helps me not blame the person. Because if you think about it, oh, those blacks, they eat that food and that's their problem. They can't choose the right diet and so that's why they're so fat. Or the people are having risky sex because black people got more AIDS than anybody else because they're having all these bad behaviors. Well, really, it's not about the behavior, it's about the environment in which we live. And so social justice makes us look at it from another set of lens. Let's get some grocery stores in the right community. They have good fruits and some vegetables so that people can eat them so that they can do better. That's injustice. And so we're trying to make things a little different. And so we can have us look at why are our kids eating the way they eat? What's in the refrigerator? What's in the home? So that makes us do something different for our educational programs in schools and clinics and churches. But bottom line for sex research, I do HIV and AIDS research. And I tended to all this time to look at it. Um, what blacks are doing, you know, in all my papers, I'm really highly published and got a lot of grant money for looking at HIV risk among black folks. Woo! Finally, it hit me in, a, in, in my whole course I'm teaching this thing. We're all really thinking about it, looking at it differently. <laughs> blacks are not having no more risky sex than anybody else. We are not. HIV and AIDS is not here because we, we're doing this bad stuff. It's that where we live. It's our communities where we live. What happens in our community is that when you are infected with the virus and you live in a community that has a zip code of highly infectious people, your sex partner's uh, allocation is minimal choice. You, you, you easily get infected because your community, your network, where you hang out at, where you live and play and have sex at, has more virus than another community in a zip code that's different. So white folks or other folks of different cultures can be in a different zip code where there's hardly no incidence of HIV and can have unsafe sex but their chances of getting the virus is different because of their network of communities where they live and play and have sex. So that gives me a different way of looking at what's going on in my community so that we can do different programs around networking. And we don't have no money to leave our, leave our hoods. So we gotta stay in the community and date the guys we hang out down the street with. <laughs> so <laughs> so, it's, so we, got, we got more work to do now, a different set of lenses. Come on, y'all know. <laughs> Don't get me started. Where's my water? <laughs> <laughs> you had your hand, sis. I'm going back to you. Okay, sis. I like your shirt anyway. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's, I guess similar to what Loretta was talking about with, with HIV, having been around in that community. So we're dealing with uh, a lot of hepatitis B just happened to have been in Asia and in lots of parts of the developing world, okay? And so the chances are that people are having sex with other people who have hepatitis B is higher. And then what happens over generations is that uh, women who are infected at the time of pregnancy will pass that on to their children. And then children who are infect, people who are infected as infants are more likely to become chronically infected over a lifetime, whereas people who are infected as adults often get sick and then get over it. And so if you are infected as a child, you're much more likely to carry that infection for the rest of your life and infect a lot more people along the way, mm -hmm. okay? And it's also those people with those chronic infections that are the ones who become at risk for liver cancer. And so it's those types of things epidemiologically in terms of where it's been located uh, geographically over time that has made a difference. Now, of course, uh, immunization and screening of pregnant women has made a huge difference here in America and also is starting to make a difference in other countries, but we're really behind in terms of dealing with those issues in other countries. Many people, you know, we've studied immigrants here in, a, in Philadelphia and they've don't know that screening is available. They don't know if they themselves have ever been screened by their doctors. They don't know if the immunization is there. Um, 
And so there's a knowledge level that doesn't exist. And people don't talk about it in the communities because they're embarrassed about it if they do have it. And so if they're embarrassed about it, there is a, it and you don't talk about it, it becomes something that's in the background. And then you also have less public knowledge about it because it's, un, it's non-disclosed and not discussed. Thank you. Yes. Uh, he, was, he was next. I'm sorry. That's OK. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, I have a question about running the unfunded uh, language services. Mm -hmm. Is it not in the institution's best of interest to have that available given the potential for compromised care or lack of informed consent um, around the, the medical consultation? Sure. I, I think that if more of these folks sued, <laughs> you'd have a greater issue there, okay? But you're not. You're going to end up with people who know English well, who know how to work the system, who are going to be uh, going through the legal route, and then the other people just kind of deal with it because I guess that's what I have to deal with, you know. And so uh, people don't know their rights. People don't know that they're that these are things they can ask for. People are coming from communities where you don't question the doctor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, those are a lot of the things that kind of prevent that. And so institutionally, there isn't, hasn't been a lot of pressure for that to happen. And we just said is that institutionally, is that they try to keep the marginalized, vulnerable population marginalized and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so systems are set up in places that doesn't help us to move further and to change and get rid of some of that stuff. And so um, we've got a lot of work to do. Next question. The sister right here had a hand up coming over. Go ahead. So I'd like to hear the panel's thinking on health care from a different perspective. I work a lot with big pharma, and specifically pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. aren't allowed to sell medicine, say, to, to Japanese in Japan without having a medicine uh, drug trial done in Japan. And that implies a role of culture and food and water in the patient's ability to uptake in the medicine. So my curiosity is what's your thinking about the role of big pharma here in the U.S. in terms of its responsibilities to the pluralistic communities that we deal with because different communities eat different foods <laughs> and it may imply some relationship to drug testing, drug, trial, drug, drug trials, et cetera, et cetera. Your thoughts? Well, I, th I think that um, drug development is very important and we, and uh, you know, I know pharma gets, gets a bad rap in a lot of, of my circles because you know, there's the, the, the uh, feeling that big pharma pressures people, kind of insinuates themselves into our medical education process and influences medical student prescribing, uh, or medical students future prescribing, resident prescribing provider, you know, they take people out to these fancy dinners and then eventually people will prescribe those things. And, I, and, and certainly uh, there is evidence that this type of marketing works, yes, okay? we do it. <laughs> uh, because that's why it's done. At the same time, if we didn't have pharmaceutical companies investing money in research and development to come up with drugs to treat people with, where would we be, right? And so I think that, uh, that there is a fine line that we need to walk in terms of how we deal with pharma. Now, uh, with regard to different communities uh, and how we deal with FDA approval and, and the equivalent in other countries. I do think that there are some uh, population level differences in drug metabolism that need to be uh, kept in mind. And, and I know that, for example, many Asian uh, American people have genetic differences that affect their drug metabolism in the uh, you know, P450 and other types of, of, of areas where um, you know, a certain dose of drug is going to be metabolized at a different rate. And so you end up with higher um, side effects and so on. So, so I think that it's important to think about the communities that you're going to market to and be able to, to study how that drug works in those communities. So, so there, there is something to that. But I don't know if other people have thoughts as well. I'd like to um, pay attention to the fact that chemicals are chemicals. And there are chemicals in food. And we, we're only learning now how important it is to look at the foods that we eat. For American Indians, uh, we were hunter-gatherer societies. And in fact, our skeletons from 10,000 years ago were healthier than skeletons are now because they ate fish, 
meat without fat, buffalo. Uh, they also had uh, grain. Uh, they did not have grains, and I want to come back to that. But berries and other things that they would gather. Now, in terms of grains, one of the things, it's not just an equity. We have some poor science that has been out there for a long time. Um, the, the understanding of, of grains is very important to the development of different groups, whether we call them racial or what we call, but, but different parts of the world receive grains at different times. Those groups that had grains last across the globe Russia, Finland, what we call American Indians, Native Alaskans, Scandinavia, they have the highest rates of alcoholism. In a sense, there we have not developed, our bodies have not developed the ability to deal with grain-based products, which in this case, uh, alcohol is to a great extent. Now, the grains that American Indians did have, and this is something you're hearing on television right now in your media presentations, we did have small amounts of wild rice, not a lot, and we had, of course, corn. However, no self-respecting Indian tribe ever ate corn off the cob. Each group has a recipe for how to use either lye or lime to release the amino acids in the corn so that we have protein. And when missionaries came to the United States, they said, oh, you don't have to do that stuff. That's pagan. You just cook it and eat it. Now, I don't know how Indians learned about lye, but I would guess they got some ashes from the fire and they're cooking, and eventually, you know, it worked. Um, but now we're hearing about problems, do we call corn syrup, which is in all of our products, or do we call it corn sugar? <laughs> and this is a major debate now. Corn syrup, as I call it, has been in all kinds of packaged foods we haven't known about. And so in a, I have this strange feeling that Indians, if we wanted to be vengeful, have gotten back at the world in two ways. <laughs> corn <laughs> and nicotine. Tobacco. <laughs> so uh, it hasn't helped us especially, but this is important. We need to look at what chemicals are, whether they're you know, pills that we take or what we ingest, et cetera. Good point. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question in the back. Remember, she said her hands up with the baby. Go ahead. You come up here next. Very good question, Candace. I didn't hear all the questions. I'm 72 years old and my ears are going, so um, can you make it brief and what I need to answer? Racism and health. Racism and health. Well, uh, there's no question that uh, the history of conquest on all indigenous peoples uh, has been terrible. Uh, the death, the result. Uh, Unfortunately, here even on this campus, we are told that Indians did not die by design. It was just that uh, we didn't have immunity to uh, the organisms that were brought in from Europe. Uh, that actually is not correct. Uh, there were all kinds of policies written to uh, both burn villages, uh, remove buffalo, one of the most most important things that happened in decreasing Indians in this country was to take the plains source of food, source of clothing, source of housing. Water. Yeah, water, right. So 
all of that is critical. However, there are some other pieces that we have to remember, as I said, because we've got a lot of what I call red road people, and they say, well, if we just go back to what we did before, uh, we won't have any problems. But they haven't understood all the other pieces in terms of the origins of the diseases that they're suffering from. Fried bread, sadly, I have to tell you, is not traditional. If you are, how many people have had fried bread? Grape dumplings. Oh, you, you have to learn more about Indian food. But it's not traditional Indian food. What became traditional Indian food, and it's eaten at every powwow, was from the, the foods that were given to the tribes after they were removed and no longer had access to their water, to their hunting, you know, to the things that they might gather. So they were given wheat flour that they didn't have any way to combat. Their bodies were not prepared for wheat flour. They had lard and they had dried skim milk. Mm. And they did the best they could. I just want to add that I think that in part the reason why we're shifting from the, speak, the talk about health disparities to health equity is because of the recognition of the impact of racism on health disparities. When you look at um, particular outcomes, for example, infant mortality among African Americans, you see that even when you account for differences in socioeconomic status and for education, there are still disparaging outcomes between black mothers and we'll say white mothers. And part of the explanation for that is the stress or the impact of racial discrimination um, where they live, where they work, and where we are. And you know, there, there actually is some um, empiric evidence about the impact of stress. Uh, there have been studies using biomarkers of stress, such as cortisol levels and other sure. things, uh, looking at uh, rates of preterm birth and other infant uh, outcomes. and. Um, and also looking at things that you might think have nothing to do with, uh, with the health of a pregnancy. For example, if you have lived close to a murder, then your chances of a poor birth outcome are higher. Okay, so, so these, are, and, and this is only starting to reach a, sort of the edge of the understanding, you know, of, of w what it is, and we think that it, this is a, a marker of other stressors around in your environment that can affect the health of your pregnancy. So, so there is evidence out there to, uh, to support these ideas. Thank you. Thanks. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so uh, those of you who may not be f familiar with paper performance, you know there are certain measures, largely HEDIS measures are, are, are what's used nationally. These are certain measures where um, are used to determine how good the quality of, of the care of your patients is. So for example, in diabetics, we use something called A1C to track your, your sugar control, okay? So if you measure your A1C and it's between six and seven, then you're probably doing fairly well. If your A1C levels on average for all your diabetic patients are around 10 or 11, then you're doing kind of poorly, okay? And so there's that concern that if we use these measures as a determination of how much we pay a doctor, we say, well, 
if on average your A1C level is around 7, then we'll pay you this much per, per diabetic that you treat. But if your rates are around 10, then you're going to get less. Okay? And so usually what they've been doing is uh, trying to use the carrot rather than the stick in the sense that they try to give you more if, you're, if your numbers are better. The problem is that they're slowly, what they do is they give you this, but then they kind of slowly bring down the general rate. And so they give you this, and then they take away a little bit from the other. So that um, ultimately, <laughs> it may be a wash, but, uh, but they're trying to make it so that you are aiming toward higher performance <laughs> on these PETIS measures. And so what we see is, is cherry picking of patients. And so you have a lot of patients who are doing poorly. Then, then the doctor says, I'm sorry, I have to dismiss you from my panel because I can't take care of you. Clearly, you're not doing your part as a patient. And so <laughs> goodbye. Please find another practice. And uh, as long as you have some sort of justification for dismissing a patient, and I, you know, I've dismissed patients from my practice, but usually for reasons like you know, they threaten to harm my providers or, you know, <laughs> they, <laughs> you know th things like that. But, you know, if you, you, you're allowed to dismiss a patient, you let the insurance company know that I'm, I'm dismissing this patient from my practice, you, have, you know, they have 30 days to find a new provider. In the next 30 days, I can do what needs to be done for the patient, but after that, they're on their own. And so we do see that sometimes practices will try to cherry pick. And, um, you know, when, when you have an urban practice, you're, you're, more likely to have patients who have more difficult circumstances that prevent them from controlling their, uh, their chronic conditions so well, and, and you end up with worse outcomes. And, and it, is a, it is something that I don't think we have good answers for yet in terms of uh, how, how that works. Right now, there are certain things that, that people are, tr the insurance companies and others are are trying to uh, push that I think will be helpful for patient care, and that's the idea of creating patient-centered medical homes. Mm. And it's a whole system-wide change, and you know our practice is going through that right now. Part of it is, is uh, financially driven because our insurance companies, providers, will actually pay us more if we become a medical home, and there are criteria to, to do that. But we also think that if we don't become a medical home, our reimbursement will probably go down over time. So there are multiple pressures to do this. But we also know from the standpoint of being clinicians that we think that this will actually help the care of our patients because it will make us think systematically about how we're taking care of them, how we're communicating with our patients, how we're setting up policies and procedures within our practice. And uh, so by going through this process, we hope to improve the care. Good point, good point, good, good, good. Anybody else have any other questions? More questions, we need more. Okay, right here, then you, then you, okay? <laughs> no matter what you do, it's going to be dealing with racism. No matter what they try, whatever they treat, whatever they introduce, who they introduce it to or for, no matter what, the group is going to feel like they're targeting you. And so as we try to understand more about medicine and new treatment regimes as they come along, um, we just have to keep our eyes and ears open because no matter what they do, people are going to feel a certain kind of way. And you know, as we go forward, all of us have a role in reducing health disparities and health equity. Everybody in this room has a role in doing it. So our panelists are sharing stuff, but everybody in this room, you have the power to make a difference too. So before we close out, we're going to talk about your role in all of this. Next. I just want to add to what Thank you.
what you know what you just said? It's language. Yeah. It's the words you use to get what you're trying to get done. So they're dealing with the same thing, but it's all in how you present it to the patient, how you explain it to the public. So now that's a different explanation versus targeting a race versus targeting a gene. Good point. Next. Is it a choose here? Yes. Um, Sorry. So uh, it, it's rather complicated, uh, the, the, the idea of patient-centered medical homes, but there are uh, about nine different areas where you have to make sure that you're satisfying particular care. So for example, how, how much access do you provide to your patients? You know, do you have someone who answers the phone 24-7 in case there's an emergency? Do you have uh, evening hours? Do you have Saturday hours? How long does it take for a patient to get an appointment with you? You know, so access things, you have communication things, you have right. record keeping uh, improvements such as creating an electronic medical record that has a searchable database where uh, you can immediately find someone's record where it's accessible. Um, so how well do you uh, monitor particular diseases over time and do you have policies in place to uh, improve your measures for, for certain chronic conditions? So, you know, I probably do a three hour talk about just oh. that, but, but <laughs> again, it, it's basically you know, a very systematic way of setting up a medical practice so that it really takes into account all of these different factors that improve patient care. Thank and you. With um, community health communities, if they are, so community health, for example, community clinics, for yeah. example, uh, I, uh, if they accept insurance, sure. Good point. Sit in the back. like to respond to that. As academics, we're taught to write papers that most people don't understand. Nor read. <laughs> and one of the things, the changes we have seen in the Indian community have not been brought about by health professionals. We don't have very many Indian doctors or nurses. And the nurses we have are community college trained at best. And they're trained, going back to an old <laughs> battle. Um, but when you can get to the people the information they need in user-friendly ways, it starts to work. We start Native American Times, a national Indian newspaper, had started working, before we started working with them, had started looking at type 2 diabetes and saying, what is going on here? What's wrong? What's happening to our people? Why are they not successful, et cetera? We joined with them in getting conferences out and getting Articles, I have written more non-academic papers that are on Native American time. I mean, you Google me. I, and those have been adopted all over the place by different Indian websites. You get the information out to people that they need to know in words they understand, and they start planting their gardens. They start doing mm -hmm. things for themselves. They learn that one of the myths I took on 12 years ago was that Indians are so strong and good and powerful that we can have a 600 blood sugar level and we won't be affected. Mm. And Myth. we could start to take on some of the, another one, tobacco is the gift from the creator and it will not kill Indians. Uh, when tobacco was given by the creator, we couldn't grow enough. And one of the things you need to know is how blacks were used in slavery 
to bring the today problem of addiction to nicotine as a problem. You couldn't grow enough small amounts of tobacco to be addicted. However, with slave labor, huge tobacco plantations began. And after that, we had the Industrial Revolution. And from there, the world. And that's how you, you know, to, point. Yeah, to, to Asia. So we mm -hmm. got to get the problem out to people in words they understand. And by the way, I put references for everything. So then I get students and faculty and people mm -hmm. writing me saying, how did you learn about light or lime for corn? So. And I think getting the message to people, especially when you're talking about young people, is getting the message to them through avenues that they access. You know, and it's not just in the school, right? right. Because you got to think, you know, are they going to respond to text messages? Are they going to respond to other types right. of things? The, you know, some folks over in California have been working in public health with Telemundo to get health topics into the telenovelas that are on tel on TV. So yes. you you start putting this into popular culture in ways mm -hmm. that are digestible and accessible and that people are going to think uh, you know outside of the schooling yeah. you know because if you're telling me I'm going to teach you something now you know right so you know so you glaze over yeah. uh, so you just kind of have it part of their every day mm -hmm. then it's much more likely to have an impact I think what you're hearing is that we are saying that it's out of the box thinking that's a traditional way. We, we professors, we write these articles in these journals. You're so correct. People don't read our stuff except for our students <laughs> and our colleagues. You know, if they get promoted, they get tenure. We got to do all those things. But we're from the school of the give back community. We want to make sure that whatever we do, we give it right back to the community in ways in which they can read it, in ways in which they can get it. And so that's partnership. That's making it happen. That's coming out the Ivy Towers and out of our offices and the clinics. And, to go into our communities and build these new relationships, these new coalitions, and make a difference. You yeah, and I'm so, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to, to finish off on that partnership thing, is yes, that the idea, and I'm so glad you brought this up, Loretta, is that uh, the, the idea of community-based participatory uh, research and participatory programming is, is very important, and it's something that Loretta does, something I do in mm -hmm. my work, and I'm sure uh, both of you as well, uh, is that, you know, you don't just go and say, I'm going to tell you what you need and I'm going to come up with something. You go out into the churches and the community centers and all of these and you work with them and you say, what is the question? What is affecting your community? And I'm here with my medical knowledge and my research skills. I want to work with you, but you tell me what's important in your community and let's work together. Your knowledge, my skills, come up with solutions that work with your community. It takes a lot longer. A lot longer. Yeah. A lot longer. And, and we, but it's so fulfilling. But it right. is incredibly but we fulfilling. That there's a professor here named Dr. Eli Anderson. He left. He's not here now. But Eli wrote this book. Dr. Anderson wrote this book called The Code of the Street. And if you read his book, he talks about, and I, I read the book and I kind of internalized it into how I think about the work that I do. And if you're trying to understand or do some work to a given population, no matter who they are, you got to take the time to understand the code of their streets. How they walk, why they talk, why they eat what they do, why the pants hang down, why they smoke, why they drink, what's going on, what's in the refrigerator, how are you going to help somebody? if you don't know the code of their street. So it means going out to the community. It means uplifting the community and partnering with them because they're only going to tell you if they trust you. And so it means coming out of our towers and doing something different. So it's really important for us as clinicians, educators, people in this room right now to think about the code of the street. You know, people, I do work in African-American communities and they say, Doc, every time you get funded, do you got to go back to the community? And I say, yeah, because I am black, but I ain't black for everybody. You know, I got to understand the hood, the community, where you're at, the, the teens, the women, the old folks, the who, the what, the who. I, I spend time, I do focus groups, I hang out, put my jeans on, my hat back, I hang out with the teenagers to understand the groove, what's going on. Man, I can't do the work I do if I don't understand the code of the street. And the more we understand and take our time, the better we can do health research and health programs and educate the change, to change inequities to equity, injustice to justice, and better programs around the country. Yes? To that point, <laughs> my question is, with respect to a very neglected population, I'm talking about incarcerated men and women. Yes. And the public health challenge that is um, created by prison reentry. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, 
Um, what, the bulk of what we do in the Office of Minority Health, which I said was, I was gonna call OMMH, is community outreach. And one of the funded programs that we have is to administer the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. Um, it comes out of Stanford, but it's a six-week workshop, essentially, in which you, you teach participants how to manage their chronic illnesses, how to prevent disease, how to take action um, over their health circumstances. You know, we, we show them how to build an action plan around uh, managing diabetes or HIV or, um, or kidney disease. So this year, I think last year, I think is the, we're one of the first states to administer that program within the correctional system. And we did it for females as well as males um, all throughout New Jersey. And it was just remarkable um, to sit in and, and sort of on the sidelines and watch what was going on. Because we're not, out, as funders, we're not allowed to participate in the group. But we did have the opportunity to have a site visit it at the facility and talk to some of the participants in the group. And they really gained a great understand, a better understanding of their role in managing their health. Now, of course, they're restricted in ways that you can't even imagine if you've never been in prison. Um, but they still were within the confines of their cell, they were able to find ways to increase physical activity, to make better choices in what they eat um, and how much they eat, just around participating in that, in that workshop. And what it is, it's like a, a train the trainer type workshop. So you train one group and then that, train, that group tra trains another group. So the whole idea is to sustain it throughout the community. And you know, it's a 10 to 15 person workshop. And um, by the end of it, you've trained you know, everyone in your area, and then you all are certified to go treat, uh, train other people. So that's um, one way we're doing, dealing with it in New Jersey. I have room for two more questions. And this gentleman with the glasses on, you had your hand up and down, and I never called on you, my brother, and I am so sorry. So let me hear from you. Thank you. 
we want to come to our senses, but we, we don't take care of the good. And these are the people actually caught in this room. Mm -hmm. One aim is that rich people get good insurance, the other aim is Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> so a lot of people in this room, uh, middle class, cannot get into good health care. Uh, so <coughs> that's one issue. The other thing is, someone just mentioned that um, Indian free, free health cannot get a good care because they got turned away from the emergency room. That can happen for Medicaid patients also because the government pays mm -hmm. so little. That doesn't cover the cost of the care. Mm -hmm. So the hospital <coughs> use any reason to turn those people away. So they don't really get good care mm -hmm. by emergency. So these are the minor issues. The, uh, um, the issue that we have to look into detail and resolve it one by one. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is a wonderful panel, and you guys have bunch of great questions, but I have to wind down now. And you can join us later if we have more questions. But what I want to do is have each panelist you know, give you a take-home statement from them to you, and for you to think about your role in some of this, too, because you know this whole thing about take, your, take somebody to the hospital day, take somebody to the doctor day, why do you think they do that? They do that to help you help somebody else, you know, because people need a, a mouthpiece, particularly your parents. And I just lost my mother in January, but I remember taking her to the doctor all the time, and not because I'm a health care provider myself, it's because I know that they talk at our adult seniors and not to them, and they can't hear them because they're so anxious, and they haven't been empowered to talk and ask the doctor, what did you say? <laughs> So you always got to take somebody, you know, because we can get in the world. But your parents will say, okay. You know, so take your mother, take your father, take your uncle, take your god, brother, take anybody. Just go with them so that you can help them navigate the system. Because everything we just said is the system is now more hard to navigate than ever before. It is hard out there to try to get the best care for your people. And so take them, stay with them, make sure they're okay, and that's your role. Now my parents are going to take something home. <laughs> you know what I mean? But seriously, it's, it's our job, as you're saying, mm -hmm. to just go out there in the trenches, learn about health and nutrition, and many of yeah. are doing this. And go, just go in there and tell them about it. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a formal thing. It doesn't have to be year by year. But it's a basic education program because a lot of our people, no matter what their nationality, simply do not know these basic you know what I mean? They go to the candy store on the way to school and spend a dollar twenty-five on junk, which is why they're sick later on in life. They don't know about apples, oranges, and so forth and so forth. Yes, no, 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 no. So the basic program, like you're saying, the moderator, I'm sorry, it's okay. the name. Anyway. Bring it down front to the community in whatever that? way we can do it. And, and it takes a village. The whole concept, it takes a village. If we want to make an impact on the world of all of us of multiple colors in this country and this world today, we got to do it with that mindset. It's not about us. It's, a, it's not about me. It's about us. And how do we do it together to make sure they make a difference? I am going to call on Dr. John Wynn to go first. You go ahead, my brother. Give me a take-home statement. Well, <laughs> well you know, I, I, I think that the, the, you know, we talked a lot about data and the importance of data, and so I really encourage you, whenever you read something about the data, Think about it twice before you make a judgment on it, okay? Because we're all, you know, Penn grads here, <laughs> okay? We, we're intelligent folks who can, who can uh, you know, dissect this a little bit more and think about that before you spread it and before you start a conversation about it because it's very important. And then uh, I would also add is the idea that the majority of health issues that we have to deal with today are entirely preventable. Mm -hmm. And we know how to prevent them. The question is, how do we make that happen? And you know, working with our communities is a great way of letting that happen. But each one of us has to walk the walk yes. as well. So that's your job. Right on. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Go ahead, Colette. Um, we talked a lot today about the importance of being involved in the community. Building partnerships in the community is key because you may be part of a faith-based organization. You may be part of a community health care center. 
you may be part of some other community-based organization, and you may be interested in education, and you may be interested in transportation, but we all need to understand that our health is impacted by every single thing that we come in contact with. So where you live may impact <laughs> your asthma. Your ability to manage your asthma may be impacted by your ability to speak to your provider and understand that you need to take this medication when you're having an attack and that medication in the morning so that you won't have an attack. Um, you need to understand that you may be allergic to certain things that will make you have an asthma attack. And th those fundamental pieces of information are things that at the community level people don't realize. They may go to the emergency room every month because of an asthma attack and not understand that they're living in an apartment that's roach infested and they're mm -hmm. probably allergic to roaches. Mm -hmm. So it's, you just have to stop compar compartmentalizing our health and, and think about it with respect to where we live, the policies that govern what we do and uh, how, we, how we manage our health um, whether we have access um, and building partnerships helps us to speak to each other and think about ways that we can infiltrate the systems that we access every day and make them understand how their role, what their role is in protecting our health. Good, thank you so much. At the, at the, at the piece, please. We talked briefly about cortisol, stress, we didn't say much about it. We heard about the prisons in Oklahoma. We have more women in prison than any other state in the country. Um, the issue of violence we haven't said much about, but I want to go from Indians to all of us. Um, the racism of violence, harassment, battering, stalking, and murder of Indians by non-Indians is a major problem. One third of Indian women are raped, and almost four in five of these victims of rape reported their perpetrator as white. Globally, rape has been declared as an act of war and conquest. Mm -hmm. The violence against Indians is not limited to women. Indian men are stalked and murdered. This violence requires legal protection that does not exist at this point. Our Indian leaders are stalked. Our environmentalists who are Indian are stalked and threatened. And just the other day, I had a phone call from an Alaskan native who called me reporting harassments, threats, poisoning of Indians, blacks, Hispanics, and homosexuals by the Michigan Christian Militia. I was in Oklahoma during the Oklahoma City bombing. We like to talk about those terrorists out there somewhere, but we have it right here. The Indian phrase that sums this up is the Lakota phrase, Matakiwil Wasson, we are all related and therefore we all have to act. Wow, let's take a time and thank the panel. I can't be with you without giving you my Ten Commandments now. I'm a church kind of girl, I'm closing out. I got the mic for one minute. One minute, close out mic. We got a wonderful panel and they really brought a home to all of us. Let's give them another round of applause. I do community-based research and HIV, but I, I really think that it's so important for us to look at my 10 commandments I want to share with you. 10 commandments for doing this kind of work. One, that must be truly committed to the community and committed to doing work that will make a difference in the residents of your community. Second commandment, thou must realize that the residents of the communities, of urban communities, have many burdens, yet our communities are resilient. It's how you look at them that must respect various traditions and cultures of the various populations within that community. The community is not all the same. Where you live, where you work, everybody's different, but respect them. That must know that community and remember to give and not take. Us researchers are always in the community taking, but we've got to remember that we've got to give back too. And not just take, but treat them like we really care. That must listen to the voices of the community. Code of the street, make sure we do that and no matter what kind of work you do, because we're here from Penn, all of us are Penn alum, this is all the things that we need to walk out of here and keep doing what we're doing. That must disseminate the findings, and I'm so excited because we talked about giving it back to the community in an understandable way that is culturally appropriate, gender specific, and reflects the learning needs and language and the styles of the population. That must be committed to doing the three T's in partnership, which is time, take the trust, and build a team. We researchers, clinicians do not have all the answers, but the community partnerships does. Last, that must partner with the community to design, evaluate, tailor, and disseminate these back programs back in a way to save the lives, not to hurt them. 
and must develop linkages and partnerships all the time, all the time.